seated. I've asked David if he will come and read for us from the text from which I'll be preaching. John 6, beginning in verse 16. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, as if it were given unto him of my father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Father, your word teaches us that no one can come to Christ except those drawn by the Spirit. Help us to say as Peter, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In his name we pray. All right, so we're right there at the portion of Scripture that I have to preach today. David has just read for us in John chapter 6, verses 60 to 71. I've entitled this message, Offensive Truth. I know by the world's standards, that's not a title that you want to introduce if you're trying to win friends and influence people. But, and I've had some say to me, you catch more flies, you know, if you put out a little honey rather than vinegar. Well, we're not trying to catch flies. And ever since the Lord has taught me the gospel of his dear son, I dare say shamedly, I did not always preach it. I started preaching far too soon before the Lord ever opened my eyes. I say that, but the Lord purposed even that to make it even more precious right now. The glorious truth of, of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I thank him that he did not leave me to myself. And so what I have to preach today straight from this word is not just from the word, it's not for information, but it is a testimony of how God has been pleased to be gracious and merciful to this poor sinner. And I tell you that apart from him having taught me, I would not be standing here today preaching this truth, which I would say to all of us at some point, we did find offensive. If you came into this thinking, well, I've always believed this, then I would say you probably never really had your ears and eyes open because the word of God is like a, a sword, a double-edged sword, piercing to the divide and sunder between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. And when it pierces, it's a double-edged sword. It, it kills self, but at the other hand, it makes a lie. So that's what we have here in this particular text as our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching. And we've been in this chapter now for some time, going all the way back to the beginning where there are multitudes that followed him for one reason or another, having seen the miracles and the multiplying of the bread. And yet our Lord knows those that are his, just like Brother David read just a little while ago. He knew those that were, were his that would believe, and he knew from the beginning, it says in verse 64, who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. Contrary to what many preachers today who seek to preach in such a way as not to offend, not even our Lord himself. And he's the prince of preachers, by the way. He's the one that we all need to hear. But he didn't seek to placate his hearers. 
and nor do any of his servants. He simply declared the truth, and when we say that, what did he say about himself? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And that just doesn't mean simply by knowing him or by him giving you his approval. By me means drawing those to himself for whom he paid the debt. Just as he said here again in verse 65, John 6 and verse 65, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me. You see that word can? That's the word ability. I've preached before, you won't find the word responsibility in the Bible. It doesn't exist. When you break down that word, it means the ability to respond. None of us has an ability to respond. Now, you will find accountability to whom we will give an account, but it doesn't come from any ability in us. So that's a strong statement right there in verse 65. Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me, except what? It were given unto him of my father. That's the point of truth that many today ignore. It's not that they don't see it, but they, in their flesh, they try to work around it because they want man to have his part. As you've heard me say before, I've had people ask me, well, what, what's our part then? Our part's the sin. It's the depravity. It's the wretchedness. That's it. Nothing but a corrupt, polluted, Flesh, that's all we have. But as far as salvation, it's of the Lord. And even with our Lord, most times in preaching, his hearers were offended. If they weren't offended, it's because their, their ears were blocked. And they couldn't hear. But it seems that as he was preaching, there were some that were stirred and heard enough to know that they did not like what they were hearing. And I found that over the years. Some people, as they sit and listen for a while, it's like all of a sudden the light comes on and they hear almost for the first time what you're saying, but it's not a hearing unto salvation. It's a hearing unto condemnation. They get mad. As I've said, some get glad, some get mad, and some get confused. But if any do hear, it's going to be the Lord. In John chapter 7, we're going to be seeing this next chapter, verse 43. Notice how it's put here. And again, this is our Lord continuing to teach those that were following him, but for different reasons and motives. Here it says, so there was a division among the people because of him. I would say that's the one true scriptural division. We hear of congregations dividing for one reason or another, right on down to not liking the carpet or color of the paint, or not necessarily liking the manner of the preacher. All these things you hear when people tell, well, I left that congregation. Well, why did you leave? They don't leave over a message. Most of the time they leave because they're not getting enough recognition or they feel like they might be better used somewhere else and they're going to go down the road to where they can get what they want. But a true division, if it's over him, if it's over Christ, then let it be. That's the divide that this truth brings. And therefore, I would say it's the divide between the sheep and the goats. Because those that are sheep will follow him. I've learned over the years, you cannot offend God's sheep to where they're going to run and uh, leave him. But the goats will be offended for one reason or another because their one desire is not Christ. Now, when we talk about the offensive truth, Christ in his manner was not offensive. In fact, if you look over in Luke chapter 4, when he was preaching in the synagogue and they handed him the scroll from Isaiah to read, you notice the first reaction to his reading. And honestly, I would have loved to have been there myself to hear our Lord read the very scriptures that he inspired and wrote. Can you imagine? 
But in Luke chapter 4, it says there in verse 14 to begin with, that when Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee, and there went out a fame of him, a recognition, a report of him through all the regions round about. And he went, verse 15, and taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Can you imagine that time, the blessing for him going into these synagogues where the scriptures are read and speaking of none other than himself unto them. And it says there in verse 16, when he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had found, he opened the book, and he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord, that's in Isaiah 61, is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That word is actually the word jubilee. You realize it was in the Jewish jubilee, that 50th year that our Lord laid down his life and thereby redeemed and purchased unto himself a people that had been given him of the Father but had been under the bondage of the law and now we're freed. That was the acceptable year of the Lord. And when he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Something about the way he was reading these scriptures. Their natural minds drawn to him. And then he said, he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So when you just read Isaiah 61 and look what it says, you don't see really anything offensive there. It's speaking of this one who was to come to preach the gospel to the poor, sent him to heal the brokenhearted. And you can almost hear the crowd saying, amen. But when he said this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears, all of a sudden, the clock starts turning in the, in the people's minds. But here's where I said his manner was not offensive. All bear witness of him and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? There's where the mind starts turning. Now, wait a minute. He just read this scripture that we've heard read, but now he's saying that this scripture now is fulfilled in your ears. Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me, This proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. And then he went on. See, this is where we see him not just reading the word and letting it be open to any man's interpretation. He told them, I tell you the truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, that wasn't even in the country of Israel, a city of Sidon unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Now, those are fighting words. Because to none in Israel, except for a widow in Sarepta, out of Israel, Naaman the Syrian, this was the enemy. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, and they might that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. See, it's not his manner. I know there's times where we, as preachers in the flesh, we can perhaps by our manner offend. And wrongly so, when we're trying to drive home a point, but even then, we have to realize we're not going to make people hear and understand by raising our voice or driving home a point and thinking that somehow that's 
how God is going to reveal Christ in any sinner's heart. We have an offensive message that we proclaim, but let's not be offensive ourselves in our manner, following the example even of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the question, coming back to my text here in John chapter 6, verses 60 to 71. Why is the truth offensive to natural-minded sinners? Let me give you a few answers from our particular text here. Number one, it's because the truth is contrary to everything in our flesh as fallen creatures. That's why we see in this particular text here in John chapter 6, many of these that followed our Lord for a while and yet turned away. You say, well, what was so offensive? Well, when you read the scriptures, there's no glory given unto man. All the glory belongs unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So the truth is contrary to everything that this flesh in its fallen, depraved state represents. When it says here in verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? I don't worry so much about people that respond in this way. After you've finished declaring God in all of his glory and in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, that there would be those that would hear enough to say, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? At least in that question, they're acknowledging that what they have just heard is so contrary to this flesh. Who can hear it? And we know the answer. None can hear or see or understand or come to Christ apart from God himself granting that grace to come. But I worry more about people that never ask the question. I have preached over the years to some that can sit there for a long time on this message and it doesn't faze them. They come for other reasons. They're sitting there in the, in, the, in the seat. They hear it, but it's just, it's like words on a dead man's ears. I worry more about that than somebody that comes in and gets upset over what they've just heard. I always, in my heart, tend to think that there's some hope for that one because they heard enough to be offended. And I'll tell you, we need to be offended. This will needs to be offended. All that we are in our being, we need to take sides with God against ourselves. If we're ever going to be truly followers of the Lord. Now here when it says many therefore of his disciples, you should somewhat read that and think, well then are these ones who were the Lord's and then eventually went away? We've heard preachers preach that way. Well, you better be careful because if you don't keep following, then you could lose your salvation. Now, this word disciples simply means learners or followers. I liken it to students that show up in class, but they're not really there to learn. They get their name checked off on the roll, and they can say, well, they're going to such and such a school, and I'm a student there, but the question is, what are you learning? This was the case here with with these that were following the Lord from place to place, many attended to his ministry as he went from place to place. And I dare say probably many had been baptized by John the Baptist. If you look over in John chapter 4, so there again, just because people make a profession and are baptized, immersed, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're the Lord's says in verse 1 here, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized none but his disciples. So this was a time when people were following and flocking and even getting in the water and being baptized along with so many others. And you ask yourself, well, where were all of these? Well, here they are again, still following him in chapter 6, but for a time. 
And when it says here in verse 60, this is a hard saying. It's not hard to understand. Now, this scripture that we're reading here, we read it to our children and grandchildren. It's not hard to understand. But the hard part of it is in belief and accepting. That's the issue. I dare say that on every one of the gospel scriptures that deal with God and his sovereignty. It's not hard to understand what the scriptures say that God is sovereign and he does according to his will, when he will, where he will. So why don't people believe it? Because it's clearly written in the scripture. Well, they don't believe it because their will, they won't believe it. And that would be our case were it not for God exercising his will and his grace. When we speak as the scriptures do, it's not difficult, it's not hard to understand that when Christ died, he didn't die for everybody. I mean, you can go through the scripture. Christ said that in his prayer. I pray not for the world. What's hard to understand about that? But I pray for those that the Father has given me. But what do you have people do? They say, well, world means world. Well, take your dictionary and go look it up. There's four or five different meanings of the word world depending on the context. Just because you refuse to have a Jesus that didn't lay down his life for everybody, but laid down his life for that people that the Father gave him, that doesn't change the truth. But it's an offense to you. It's not hard to understand. It's just that you will not. Christ said you will not come, but you might have life. And here's where we need to prayerfully ask that the Lord every time these scriptures are open give us who confess and profess to be the Lord's to give us this heart not to turn aside because of people's being offended could be family members it could be other people in the congregation we've experienced that where different ones come up and say you know your preaching's kind of got this one upset or that one upset well, what do you want me to do about it? People will come and kind of quietly nudge you a little bit and say, well, maybe you can tone it down a little bit. Or maybe try to preach it when not so many are there. I've heard some suggest that. No, the truth has to be known. And even here in verse 61, this is the deception of the heart because you'll notice it says when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at him. What I understand from here, yes, there were all these that were following him that are called disciples. And yet here specifically, the Lord, knowing their heart, it says knew in himself. So it's not even that he was hearing them talking about this. But as he was declaring the truth, even they began to murmur at it. And that's why he said unto them, Doth this offend you? So again, even our own hearts, were God to leave us to ourselves, eventually we're going to find something in this word that's going to be an offense. Especially as some have done under the preaching of the singular exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ, they begin to think about their parents. They begin to think about their children, and they think, well, if I truly believe what, what they say is your preaching, but really, if I truly believe what this word says, that means my parents were not the Lord's. Or if I believe this, that means my children were not the Lord's. And whether they express it or not, in their heart, they begin to waver. This is where we need the Lord's grace to keep us true. Because what did Christ say? If you don't deny yourself and renounce father, mother, brother, sister, you, he's, he didn't say you might not be my disciple. He said you cannot be my disciple. 
That's the hard saying. It's where we begin to see this particular division coming because people begin to reflect and think about, well, if I believe this, then that's going to put me in isolation or separate me out. Better to be in isolation. Better to be separated out under the Lord than to follow after men. So that's the first answer to that question as to why this message is offensive, because it's contrary to our flesh. And I confess it is. Even to this flesh, it's contrary to everything that this flesh would have me believe, and yet, by the grace of God, I can look nowhere else but to the Lord Jesus Christ and that finished work that he accomplished at Calvary. So that's the second point here is that the truth gives all the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ and not to man. It's contrary to our flesh, but in this book that we're reading here, in these scriptures, this word that men find to be hard and difficult and offended by, what's the offense? It's giving the Lord Jesus Christ all the glory. That's why you see there in verse 62. Our Lord didn't halt, knowing their thinking and their objection. He says, he, he becomes even more precise. What and if ye shall see the Son of Man, see, they're looking at a man. And they're already, this group, arguing over the fact that he said he was that bread of life come down from heaven. And unless anybody ate his flesh and drank his blood, they don't have eternal life. They're thinking in natural terms, who is this man? that he should make such a declaration, even saying he came down from heaven. They understood what he was saying. I and the Father are one. And so he says, and what if ye shall see the Son of Man now ascend? You're offended over me walking in the flesh? And what and if you shall see the same Son of Man ascend up where he was before? He's not backing off. In that one statement, verse 62, it gives him all the glory. Yes, in his state of humiliation, when they looked upon him, even as we read there in Luke chapter 4, who is this? We know your father. We know your mother. We know where you were raised. Did anything good come out of that? All they saw was a man. And yet, it was necessary that he be that man. Because the blood of bulls and goats couldn't put away sin. And to answer to God's law and justice, it was necessary not only he be the man, but he be the perfect man. Without sin, without fault, without blemish. Offered unto God. That's what it was to eat his flesh and drink his blood. To believe that in his coming in the flesh and his shedding his blood, that that is the salvation of sinners. It's not in what I believe or how I believe or when I believe. It's in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished. And if you're offended by that, and many are, offended by who he was in the flesh, what and if then, when you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before into glory. Here's the whole gospel, isn't it? That we find described in the scriptures in Ephesians chapter 4, if you look over there with me. I love these portions of scripture that just summarize the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 4, it's describing the faith of the Lord's people. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, in verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. When he says in you all, he's writing here to those that the Lord had taught by his spirit, to the Ephesians, the elect, the redeemed. But unto every one is, of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of, of Christ. In other words, if we're the Lord, it's by his grace. And it's according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Christ is the gift without measure. He gave himself completely, and so is the grace. 
You're not going to find in Scripture where it says that Christ died for some who end up in hell anyway. Notice in verse 70, the grace is according to the measure of the gift of Christ. If he died for you, then God has been gracious to you, and he will indeed draw you to Christ and will keep you in him. Both go together. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, so we talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ being vital to the, the gospel. But don't forget the ascension. It's all vital. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Well, who were the captives? Who was the captivity? That's all of his elect that were under the law until such time as Christ paid the debt. goes all the way back there to hell. All the way forward. Of all time, that law under which even the elect stood condemned legally, it's not that they were ever under the wrath of God, but under the law, they stood condemned, and it took Christ coming and paying the debt. And then when he ascended on high, he took with them their souls. That's why elsewhere in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul can describe all of those that Christ redeemed as being seated in the heavenlies with him. I'm not there physically, but when he rose again and ascended on high, I rose with him. His death was my death. His resurrection, my resurrection. His ascension, my ascension. That's what gives me hope of glory. There's not seats up in heaven with people's names on them and someday... As you hear preachers say, when we get there, there's going to be a bunch of empty seats. No. Everyone that God purposed should enjoy his presence forever will be there by the grace of God and through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says he gave gifts unto men. You just have to read a little further on. In verse 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. That is, this is how Christ is speaking today throughout the world, through these gifts unto men. But now, in verse 9, that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That's speaking of his humiliation, that as he came into this world, he could not have been brought in in any lower estate than he did. The lowest part of the earth. Born in a poor family. Born in a manger. That's where his earthly life began. But that wasn't the beginning of his existence. God purposed that he should be so brought into this world in a state of humiliation that none should think themselves too low for God to be merciful and gracious. I'm thankful it's that way. But that was his beginning. But look at his end, verse 10. He that has descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. That's what he's speaking of here, coming back to my text in John chapter 6. So here we see again how... The truth that offends, it offends because it gives all the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you find any that are offended, it's because they're one part of the glory. You can just mark it down. And unless the Lord, by his grace and spirit, humbles such a one, they'll die in their offense. Because the truth is who he is. It's in Christ. And that's why we read, in verse 63, how is it that any will perceive this? How is it that any will truly give the Lord Jesus Christ all the glory? Well, it says that the Spirit, it's the Spirit that quickeneth. What does that tell you right there? It's that sinners remain dead until such time as the Spirit quickens. Just like the Lord told Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born from above. He was addressing that specifically to Nicodemus, knowing that Nicodemus was one for whom he would pay the debt. 
The Lord is not going to leave in spiritual deadness any that the Father gave him and for whom he paid the debt. So again, if you're here still hanging on to something in yourself, look at the very next phrase, verse 63. The flesh profiteth nothing. Well, look that word nothing up. Nothing means nothing. Well, but isn't there just at least some little good if it would just fan the flame enough and we can get people? Nope. Nothing. No more than a cadaver out there buried in the cemetery. Nothing. That, that flesh is nothing but corrupt. Prophet of nothing. And that's where he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So you say, well, why doesn't everybody believe that? Well, because he doesn't give this spirit. Here again is the offense. The one who has the spirit and has the life to give, he gives to whom he will. That's why two people can be sitting and listening to the same message. One, their ears are open and they rejoice in hearing what they hear. The other gets up and goes out having heard nothing. The one who heard can't take any credit because if we hear, it's because Christ's purpose that we hear and gave his spirit and breathed life into this otherwise dead soul that we might hear him and follow him. But this is how the scriptures give all the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ and to none other. Not only in his person and who he is coming in the flesh, but in how he manifests his spirit and gives life. But thirdly, as verse 64 says, we're looking at how Christ gets all the glory. It's in his knowing from the beginning who they are. Notice here, it doesn't say that he knew from the beginning who they were that would believe. Some people say that, well, he just looked down through time and saw who would believe. Well, none would believe what, what he's ordained should believe. Here it says, Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that what that believed not and should betray him. So even there, we see that to believe on Christ is according to his prerogative, not man's. Our nature is not to believe. And so he knew from the beginning who they were that believed not. In fact, there was a whole crowd in front of him. Some would look at this and see how many were following after him and say, wow, that's great. Look at the great work. But here the Lord says he's looking on them as ones that would not believe and who should betray him. Our Lord is not deceived by false faith nor by those that betray him. We're surprised by it. We'll see some people that will sit for a while and listen, and they get up and go out. And we wonder, how is it? I, you know, they came so faithfully for a long time, and now look where they are. Look where they ended up. Well, the Lord knew all along those that would not believe. That's not a surprise to me. Thank God he also knows those that will believe. Why? Because he knows those that the Father gave him. This is how Christ can solve the glory. And so in verse 65, therefore said I unto you. You see, he keeps coming back to this. The very point of offense is what he comes back and insists upon. And I say again, you can't offend God's sheep. Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Perhaps they followed him halfway around that Sea of Galilee to get to where they were here. But they had not truly come to him. 
That's a long distance when you think about it, running after Christ only to hear him say, no man can come to me except it were given him of the Father. It's like one lady said to me one time and asked me, so all of these years that I've been teaching Sunday school count for nothing? Yep, they count for something. They count for dumb. That's it. Don't think in terms of, well, look what I've been doing to serve the Lord all these years. I've been handing out Bibles. And I've been witnessing. all it amounts to nothing. If any are to come to Christ, it's going to be because, as it says there, they were given unto him of my Father. That's not everything. But the certainty is that those the Father gave him shall come to him. And for that reason, those that come to him, he will not cast out. That's why this message is an offense. Because it gives all the glory to Christ. Thirdly, this message is an offense because it's purpose to divide. That it, the, this word never says that God really would like everybody to be saved. The offense is in that when this gospel is preached, it does divide between the sheep and the goats. It's like that scripture I quoted there in Hebrews 4, dividing asunder of soul and spirit. This gospel, this truth, will divide between those that are true disciples and those who are mere pretenders. Now, I can't discern that. I can't look out here or anybody listening and see somehow, well, they're God's elect. It's because they're sitting and listening. Look at all these that were following him. But I will tell you this, that as you continue to declare and exalt the single, solitary, work of Christ in his person, it is going to do the dividing for you. Everything in religion today is about numbers. And there's some that think if they could come join your congregation, they could help your congregation grow. They could bring people in. Let people say that. I, I could help you. Well, not likely. Because of all the years that I've been preaching this gospel by God's grace, I've seen the divide. I've seen seasons where there have been a lot of people that have attended. Even here, I've seen years where we couldn't fit everybody in this room. But over time, we see people come and go, come and go. And the world that drives by, they'll look at a small building like ours and they'll think, doesn't seem like a whole lot going on there. They're going to go down the road where the parking lot is full because they think, well, that must be where God is, not necessarily. Here it says in verse 66, and this is where you see the divide, from that time. But you notice time is an italic. Just read it, from that <laughs> From that point, what point? Verse 65. Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that, if he had just not said that, if he had just simply acknowledged us and our efforts and our willingness to follow after him and be his, but from that declaration, except it were given unto him of the father. What happened? Many of his disciples went back. Now, I'm thankful it doesn't say all. It says many. But there are those, as even as we see here as we, we read on, when the Lord asked the question that the 12, verse 67, will ye also go away? Who won't go away? Well, it's those that... <laughs> He came to redeem. It's those that he's drawn by his spirit. And that's what Peter declared there in verse 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? I like his question. It's not to what shall we go, to whom? Because that's what salvation is. It's in the very person of Christ. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. 
And I'll tell you this, if in your heart you're thinking there's some other way, then God help you. Because thou hast the words of eternal life. And he says, we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the same thing that he declared over there in Matthew when the Lord said, well, who do men say that I am? They gave all their opinions. And he said, well, who do you say I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, there in Matthew 16. And what did the Lord say? Simon bar Jonah's flesh and blood have not revealed that unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. But the truth divides. That's why it's an offense to, to many, but not to all. If you can sit here today and hear this message and rejoice, then thank God, because he didn't leave you alone. And the final statement I'll make here with regard to why the gospel is an offense is that it's an offense because God himself does the saving. Plus nothing. Without any of man's efforts or works or will contribute. The truth is that only those whom God has chosen, Christ redeemed, the Spirit drawn. When he says that he saves them, he not only saves them, but he keeps them. And that's what we see here in Peter's testimony. Doesn't mean he wasn't going to deny the Lord. As he got close to Christ's death, we know how Peter denied the Lord. They're around that fire, just like Judas did. And you say, well, why was Peter saved and not Judas? Well, Peter had Christ. Christ purposed that Peter be saved. And he purposed, even as it says here in our portion, he knew those that would not believe on him and should betray him. Judas betraying Christ was not a surprise to Christ. It was purpose. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So that's the offense that God saves whom he will. But I'm thankful that whom he saves, they are saved indeed. Not to be the Lord's is to be no better than the devil. You see that in verse 70? Jesus answered them, have not I chosen you twelve, but one of you is a devil? <laughs> that, that, that offends right there. People's sense of their goodness. But I will tell you this, that apart from Christ, that's all any of us are. Devils. Thank God for his grace in Christ. All right.